Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ask Concussion Dog episode number 99, the Wayne Gretzky of podcast episodes. Uh, I can't believe it's already 99. You should have done next week, Paul, because then you'd be number 100. But uh, unfortunately, that is going to go to Melinda. She's going to take that nice. next week. Today's topic is concussions in women. We're going to be talking about risk factors for women and concussion. We're going to be talking about hormones. Uh, we're going to be talking about post-concussion syndrome, uh, maybe even getting into menopause, menstrual cycles, things that affect specifically women and concussion and uh, potentially some therapeutic angles that you might want to look into uh, if you are a female struggling with post-concussion syndrome. So I'm going to first lay out the stats um, around some of the data regarding concussions in women. So sure. after, after age 25, women tend to get more concussions than men. Prior to age 25, men seem to get a larger number of concussions than women. And this comes down to mostly contact sports. So before age 25, boys tend to get more concussions than girls. After age 25, women tend to get more concussions than men. When you look at, however, people younger than age 25, when you look at sex comparable sports. So if you look at sports that are non-contact for both sexes or sports that are contact for both sexes, so sex comparable sports. So for example, a sport like basketball, the rules are the same, whether or not you're male or female. When you look at a sport like hockey, for example, men's hockey is full contact. Women's hockey is a non-contact game. So we're only talking about the sex comparable sports, right? Rugby is contact for both sexes. When you look at sex comparable sports, generally it's one and a half times. Females are one and a half times more likely to be diagnosed with a concussion than males playing the exact same sport. So there are some theories on this. Uh, one theory is a difference in neck strength, meaning that maybe males have stronger necks than females. And so because of that neck weakness, there's potentially more acceleration uh, to the head. So impacts are more likely to result in concussion. This has kind of been disproven as neck strength seems to not really be correlated with concussion risk or severity. So that one is a little bit lower on my list. Another one is the idea of game awareness. Well, if you look at a sport like hockey, for example, maybe females get more concussions than males because they're not, you know, it's, it's a non-contact game. And if they're not expecting a hit to happen, potentially they're not ready for that hit, which then um, leads to a concussion. Now, this doesn't really help us when we're comparing two sports that are identical right? Because if there's contact or non-contact, depending on, and it doesn't matter what sex you are, that idea kind of falls apart as well. The third theory behind why females may get more concussions than males is simply termed the honesty hypothesis. The idea that maybe females are just more likely to report that they have concussion symptoms or that they think they may have a concussion. And because of this, we just, it tends to show up in the numbers. We see a higher number of female concussions. So that's one theory. Uh, whereas, you know, the idea that males may be more likely to try and hide the fact that they may have a concussion. And another one has to do with hormone fluctuations. This is a newer one that's been proposed based on the menstrual cycle uh, and different phases that we'll get into. There may be some issues with increased susceptibility at different time points during the cycle. The next point is that women not only get more concussions than males, it seems that they also take longer to recover in every single age group, even in kids. Recently, there was a clinical prediction rule that was put out by Roger Zemeck and company um, at, I think they're at University of Ottawa. And they designed a clinical prediction rule that would help us to be able to assign a score to a particular patient based on what they're presenting with. Based on that score, if you have a really high score, that would indicate that you're more likely to have persistent symptoms. So a longer term recovery, more problems, et cetera, et cetera. Now in this clinical prediction rule, they actually put that if you were male, they would assign you a score of zero points. If you were female, however, they would automatically add two points to your score, mm -hmm. which is a huge difference, right? So you go from being male is no risk factor, being female now is a risk factor of two. Remember, the higher the score, the more likely it is that you're gonna have persistent symptoms. So automatically, just by your sex, they would assign you a particular increased score. Now we see this through adulthood as well. 
Uh, every study pretty much that comes out shows that females tend to present with higher symptom severity, tend to have a more prolonged outcome uh, than males. Now, again, let's talk about some of the theories behind this. The first one, again, is neck strength. Maybe that because of this difference in neck strength, maybe females are getting a more significant concussion right off the bat, which is then resulting in a longer recovery for them. So that's one. Again, there's issues behind the idea of neck strength and it may not be the issue. Pre-existing emotional symptoms is another one. So we know that pre-existing anxiety, pre-existing depression tend to result in more prolonged recoveries. We also know that when we look at studies of baseline athletes, meaning that before their injury, we're testing them in a healthy state, we know that female athletes tend to report more anxiety, more depression. So maybe going into the injury with a higher risk of anxiety and depression or pre-existing conditions, that may be a cause of persistent symptoms. The next one, again, is the honesty hypothesis. Maybe after the injury, the, 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 the male uh, participants in these studies are more likely to deny symptoms and say, no, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. You know, kind of the, the macho man idea. Yeah. And maybe the females are more likely to be a little bit more honest and say, you know what? I'm not feeling quite back to hundred percent. And lastly, and the one that we are going to probably cover most of today is hormone fluctuations. This has become very um, kind of hot in the concussion research, particularly around just pituitary dysfunction. But in this particular case, we're going to talk about um, more female specific hormones. So here to talk about one of those theories is my colleague and friend, Dr. Paul Herkel. I'll just give you a bit of his bio and then I will start asking him questions and let him give us his knowledge. So Dr. Herkel is a board certified naturopathic doctor with a passion to apply innovative and evidence-based nutritional, biological, and supplemental interventions to address underlying metabolic endocrine and immunological dysfunctions. Dr. Herkel has a special interest in neurological health, chronic pain, and brain injuries. He lectures extensively on the topic of integrated and natural approaches to concussions and neurotrauma recovery. Dr. Herkel is a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of Complete Concussion Management. He is a co-founder of the Concussion Fix program, which is our new online program for concussion patients with chronic PCS, post-concussion syndrome. I saw somebody just ask, what is PCS? Post-concussion syndrome. That this is patients that just aren't getting better. He also maintains a clinical practice in Toronto um, with actually two clinics. He's got one in Vaughan and one in Mississauga, Port Credit area. And now a lot more virtual because of obviously what we're going through, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that's. I think most naturopaths have gone yeah virtual at this point. Well, it's about 50-50 right now, um, and, and yeah. so it's, some patients. I mean, still really want to see you in person. But anyways, thank you so much for having me Ken. it's um it's fun to be back we've done a couple of these uh and and believe it or not in our program this is the topic that is by far been the most popular we had a ton of questions we had a ton of people in our live every week we do a live um event on zoom with our concussion fix course participants and they just love this topic so i'm glad that we're talking about it well, that's kind of the idea behind doing this for everybody on either Instagram or actually part of our podcast or YouTube channel uh, is that like the feedback on this was crazy uh when we did it we probably did it about a month or so ago and uh we had so many people turn out uh there's actually a few guys in the audience which was <laughs> which was interesting but it was it was uh it was really well received and so we wanted to share it with everybody because i think that's a good um is it's just it's a great topic and it's a very very interesting topic so uh to get into it here let's let's start talking about just from a um you know a sex difference let's let's just talk about general like kind of menstrual cycle uh and then we can talk about how that may affect um maybe injury timing um and then maybe even into recovery and after that so kind of more of a broad question to start us off but that i think will help us narrow in on yeah sure i mean obviously i mean people know that there's differences from a hormonal perspective between the sexes and and we as you pointed out i will tell you the, my practice kind of is in line with 
the, um, the stats that you just pointed out. Majority of my patients are females that have been a couple of years out after they've um, suffered a, 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 hit, a hit to the head, a concussion slash whiplash. And so they, this PCS, for those of you that are not familiar with this, this post-concussion syndrome is just really this kind of um, still being understood um, syndrome of combination of neck, neck dysfunction, a neuroinflammation, um, uh, we have structural issues happening, um, you know, at a, at a very, very cellular level, but hormones are one of the key underlying issues when it comes to PCS. And that's a lot of what I do with my, with my patients in my practice. So obviously one of the things that, that a lot of these uh, females especially will report is that they'll say they've noticed menstrual changes after they've had a concussion. And usually that happens right away, but sometimes that those changes can happen many months down the line. It's not that just you get a, a, a hormonal change right off the bat. Usually that's occurred in a very severe concussion where there's a total shutdown of your hormone production. So I'll just back it up here for a second because some of the people listening to this may not understand what's the, my concussion or what's my brain injury got to do with my hormones. There is a, a master hormone gland in the brain called the pituitary gland. And it sends out all these signaling molecules, these signaling hormones to all your organ systems in the body. So for example, growth hormone is produced by the anterior pituitary. Your thyroid stimulating hormone is produced by your anterior pituitary. Your FSH and LH that are going to go down to either your ovaries or testes. And that is how you regulate your menstrual cycle. Or you're going to have your FSH going to be regulating kind of your estrogen in the early part of the cycle. Uh, and then your LH is going to be regulating your progesterone. That's pretty simplistic, but just a good way of understanding that there is a lot of estrogen being produced in the first part of the female cycle. And then in the second part where you're preparing for menstruation or for implantation, if, uh, if a woman is pregnant, that's predominantly dominated by progesterone. So there's this kind of fine balance. And there's a difference between the two cycles in terms of what hormones are predominant. And so there's some research thinking that potentially depending on when a woman gets hit that sustains the concussion, if it's in the second half of the cycle, they may have more lasting symptoms. And that has to do with the progesterone actually as it's normally should be high because of the immediate change in the LH and FSH that's coming from the brain, you may, a female may lose their protective effect of progesterone because it, it kind of drastically goes down. So again, this is a theory. We're still trying to figure it out from, a, from an evidence-based perspective, but there, there seems to be some sort of timing to do with uh, a cycle. And oftentimes I always say that a, a brain injury or any trauma exposes an underlying imbalance. So if you're listening to this and you've had long, a long-standing hormonal issues, and then now those hormonal issues are even worse after a concussion, that may be that, that trauma kind of further expose that kind of in underlying metabolic weakness or that hormonal imbalance. Um, and so that's something that we have to work on in as one of the things to get a person back to, you know, their, uh, their optimal health. So it's interesting that you say that towards the end of the cycle, because progesterone is typically higher, correct? At, in, the like, in, cycle, in, yeah. in the second half of the cycle and progesterone, the reason why it's potentially implicated in this is because it does have anti-inflammatory properties, correct? It has more than just that, Cam. It has anti-anxiety properties. It works on the GABA receptor. It modulates calcium. And so calcium, for what we know about the pathophysiology of a concussion, is that it is uh, very dominant in terms of actually being rushed into the cell. And now the cell and the mitochondria and all the things inside the cell have to work extra hard to pump it all out. And it's often overwhelmed by that amount. And that's that initial trauma and so that's why magnesium is so important because it, it's like a counterbalance to calcium. So magnesium and potassium are mainly to do with the inside of the cell, calcium and sodium are outside. So um, it, progesterone has an ability to regulate calcium. 
Um, it has a, real, a regular ability to decrease excitotoxicity, which is again, a, a further extension of that, of that calcium. And again, that's that process that occurs right away. So it has many kind of neuroprotective effects. And a good example that would probably drive it home to anybody that's listening is that one of the things that happens in the second part of the cycle is a lot of people, a lot of women experience PMS. And, the, and that a lot has to do with the lack of progesterone or the imbalance of progesterone compared to estrogen, where the first half of the cycle where progesterone is kind of not the dominant hormone, estrogen is the one that's doing most of the job. That's kind of the time where a female might feel most balanced, where the second half of the cycle, especially the couple days or a week before your period, that's where you start getting these fluctuations and changes in the progesterone as it kind of, from its peak, it kind of goes down and then women start getting some of these symptoms. So I'm just, just to, just to kind of circle back on the estrogen, if, if progesterone is low at the first half of the cycle and it does have anti-inflammatory properties and calcium regulation properties, et cetera, I would think just logically that concussion injuries in the first half of the cycle would probably be worse than in the second half of the cycle. Yeah. You what's your, what? what's your thought on that? Yeah, like, well, you know I, I've seen, I've, I've seen the research that shows the second half of the cycle seems to be worse, yeah. but it, it just doesn't make sense to me in that way. You're, you're totally right. It doesn't, it didn't make sense to me when I first read this, I had to like go back and reread it and be like, am I reading that right? Because I've always been taught and this back from, from kind of naturopathic medical school is that, you know, typically the second half of the cycle is when a woman should get most of, you know, any medical procedure because progesterone offers that additional, you know, protective anti-inflammatory effect. Um, I've heard this in like, you know, get a biopsy done in the second half of the cycle. I've been taught that. Um, and I've see, heard that from a number of, you know, very experienced clinicians. And so I, I, I also have to do a bit of a double take. So I think to be honest, Cam, this is, to me, this is something that um, we're still trying to fully explore. I don't think we fully understand it. And uh, in terms of um, the risk at the time and the hormone level at that time, um, you know, the other thing that also threw me for a loop was they found that being on the birth control pill may be protective. And there's a lot of research showing that the birth control pill, while it masks symptoms, it also predisposes women to you know, issues down the line with hormonal imbalances, because it basically creates a synthetic hormonal situation. And majority of that is estrogen with some progesterone, again, depending on the type, you could have a IUD that is primarily progesterone as well. So there seems to be a protective uh, issue with that. And that, again, I think is, is in line with the research that we've just pointed out where it's about this, it's not about the absolute what hormones the highest, it's about the change and the potential hit to the head, progesterone's high, dip, and that's where the damage happens. And that's where the negative uh, issues start happening. So it's almost like you, we induced uh, a, a PMS, a hyper PMS situation, because that, what happens in PMS is that your progesterone starts tanking and you get all these symptoms as your, as your estrogen and progesterone are not no longer kind of in equilibrium. Well, right now we might've, based on this theory and research, concussion, progesterone goes down, we lose the protective effect in the second half. And that birth control pill may kind of keep that synthetic estrogen progesterone coming. So it protects that. So those are the two pieces of information kind of flying in the face of what you and I would logically think would make yeah. sense. But well, I'm just, I'm just thinking about this now. Um, just, you just triggered something for me because normally, you know, it's going to increase your progesterone towards the end of the cycle. And then you're going to have that major dip anyway. So maybe if the injury coincides around the time of that dip, you're probably accelerating that dip. And maybe if it happens beforehand, you're doing that. But also when you look at it from a metabolic perspective, the initial injury happens, and then it takes a few days for you to actually, you know, drop in terms of an ATP deficit level. Right. So I wonder maybe if you get hit in the first half of the cycle, um, you're, you know, you're, 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 um, your, sorry, I can't talk. I, your, I think I know what you're levels are ramping up just as your metabolic stuff is happening more. So maybe that's where you get that protective effect. But if you're already at the tail end of that, 
and you get hit just as that's ramping down. Now you're going into a low phase of progesterone while your metabolic injury is kicking up even more. I'm just, I don't know if that's accurate or not, but I'm just. It's it's an interesting thought. And and I think that, you know, there's some merit to that because we know that there's, you know, changes that occur minutes and hours after a concussion in terms of inflammation. But in terms of the impact on hormones that probably will take, you know, there is a, there's a, there's a latency period. There's a bit of a a lag period there where you probably not get the decrease in progesterone. Maybe for a couple of days, there's residual circulating progesterone. There's the residual circulating stimulating hormone. LA, uh, LH is still in the bloodstream, stimulating the ovaries to create progesterone. Um, you also have to consider that progesterone and estrogen are produced by the body's adrenal system, which is the system that helps us deal with stress. And so I think a, a lot of what I see with my patients is yes, issues with menstruation and, and you know, a lot oftentimes a, a period that's regular will become irregular or the ones that are kind of like a little bit irregular is gonna be even more irregular. Um, or maybe even stop altogether. Um, uh, That is an issue, but I think more of the issue is is that a person's energy and a person's ability to cope with stress constantly being in high fight and flight mode, being in like dysautonomia, that has to do with uh, the adrenals. And the reason I'm bringing them up is that they also produce estrogen and progesterone in lower amounts. They'll produce like maybe 20 to 30%. So I think there's something to what you're saying that as there being kind of like a lag period. So maybe a couple of days, maybe even a couple of weeks, we don't know. And then at that point, they might be already in their menses, even though their hit was in the second half, they might be in the menses. And, and that's when estrogen and progesterone are super low. And you've now lost all those protective effects because we don't want to also forget estrogen has also its protective effects in this case. It is, it keeps serotonin um, elevated. It, it definitely, the first half of the cycle um, memory is better and brain function is better because estrogen helps support that. Ask any menopausal woman and they'll say the first thing that they'll notice is that like, my memory is gone. That has a lot to do with estrogen that goes down after, after menopause. So we have to look at, and, that, and I'm really glad you bring this up because you have to look at hormones, not in isolation. I think when you get stuck in looking like, well, what's the level at that moment at the concussion? You know, there's, you're totally right there. There's a, there's a, there's a rhythm throughout the, the month, but there's also a synergy between other hormones at that time. Um, and also other hormones that are kind of being produced throughout the, throughout the whole month. So you have, I have to look at things all together. And so very rarely do I find um, any sort of benefit of being like, let's just look at one hormone. And, and all we do is just give that one hormone. You have to find about how do we find that balance? So I'm actually testing all the hormones I've talked about, plus thyroid and adrenal function and growth hormone, because they all play a role. So I just, I'm just going to uh, just go over here to our Instagram people and just let you guys know that we are going to take questions uh, at the end, depending on how much time we have. So if you do have questions, just type them into the chat and uh, we'll try to uh, try to get to them as we go. I think it'll, it'll just add to the discussion as well. Um, so now you've had the injury. All right. So you know, maybe there's, there's, there's an element of depending on when in your cycle, you got your injury that may be, um, you know, causing more issues for you. So now you have an injury and you're going through the recovery phase. I mean, we often get a question about, um, you know, you, you are, you already alluded to having a dysfunction in the cycle, um, altered periods, uh, missing periods, et cetera. Um, another one that we get, and I actually get quite a bit on the concussion fix program is people talking about increased PMS. So maybe you just want to touch on that of altering those hormones and, and, and then, and then why that would play into PMS. You touched on a little bit, but yeah, I mean, I'll just maybe expand on what I've already said. Um, so at the end of the cycle, you have your estrogen, which is high. Um, you're going to have a decrease in, in, uh, sorry, um, estrogen is high in the first part of the cycle. It goes down. Um, and progesterone goes up in the second half of the cycle, right in the middle, there's ovulation. So progesterone is in the high in the second half of the cycle. And then probably a week before a woman's period, um, you're going to have a decrease in progesterone. And that's where a lot of the symptoms start happening. And so typically PMS is associated with that kind of decrease. And especially in relation to the amount of estrogen that a woman also has. You, um, if you have, if the estrogen 
sorry, if the progesterone goes down too low in relation to the estrogen, you can have excess PMS symptoms. You can have anxiety. Um, just talked to a patient the other day where they were, they were very tearful and they're very emotional. And that's a very common thing. Um, you might get a lot of cramping and pain. Um, a lot of this, again, has to go back to the progesterone and the estrogen balance. So definitely it's progesterone going down, but it's also the ratio of the estrogen and progesterone to each other. How far does the progesterone go down compared to the estrogen? I mean, we often think it's like a very smooth curve. It just follows kind of a textbook type curve, but there's a lot of kind of like jagged edges and peaks without that. And for some women, it goes down further. I mean, a lot of times there are women are put on birth control pills because they have, you know, very strong PMS. And so what does the birth control pill do? And that gives us insight into what causes PMS is that it basically just tells the body or gives the body the hormones that it should normally be producing, where normally it's kind of not producing it very smoothly, maybe too little progesterone compared to estrogen, which is the typical pattern that you see. Well, the birth control pill is just giving you the steady amount every single day of the cycle. You stop it, they go away, flow comes, you restart it after four or five days, and then, and then away you go. So that's kind of what's happening on a, on a PMS level. The, the, the menstrual cramps, I will make a note, is that has a lot to do with an additional amount of inflammation. Because remember, hormones and things like progesterone, estrogen, they don't just regulate menses. They also regulate many other things in the body, like we've already said. So progesterone having an anti-inflammatory effect, if it's, let's say, too low, you're going to have an increased pain in the kind of preparate as the uterus prepares itself for the menstrual shedding, the lining of the uterus to shed. So that's where you get a lot of that pain. And so oftentimes an anti-inflammatory, whether it's a drug, whether it's a herb, there's research on ginger and ginger powder being really effective. Saffron, which is an anti-inflammatory, plus it has kind of a neuro, uh, kind of a neurocognitive neurotransmitter balancing effect that also has an PMS, anti-PMS effect. So inflammation is also a key consideration in this whole thing, Cam. So just in terms of, of hormone fluctuations, would this be like, if somebody has altered cycle PMS, is this something that they should be looking at is getting, getting hormones checked? And then how do you go about checking it? Are there certain times you should check it? Should you check it repeatedly throughout the cycle? How do you check it? Um, maybe just kind of elaborate on if somebody, you know, thinks that they may have something going on, um, you know, when should they be looking at this? What type of outward signs aside, you know, is it yeah. just purely these it's a great question. So, I mean, let's answer that in the context of regular menstrual cycles. And then let's answer that in the context of like post-concussion after concussion, because there's, there's overlap, but I want to make sure I, I get to both. So first of all, in general, this is for all women that are listening, you know, a good, a big sign is, is if you get any of these symptoms that really influence your activities of daily living, like for example, if you if you need to take like two mitol or, you know, a naproxen to like get through the day uh, right before your cycle, that's a pretty good sign that you probably need to get some hormonal balancing tested and addressed. And typically testing is done through blood work. And this is done by your, by your family doctor, your naturopathic doctor. Um, your gynecologist would be typically the next step that you'd get referred to if your family doc feels like they're not able to deal with this. Oftentimes, as I mentioned before, the, the kind of the, the standard, solution, which I think is a band-aid solution, is just putting a woman on the birth control pill. Now that doesn't solve anything. That just basically gives you a synthetic hormone from an external source. And it just, it does take away symptoms in a lot of cases, but it doesn't necessarily address the root cause. Now the argument can be made that, you know what, maybe this is just something that a, a girl is experiencing in her teenage years and she has to kind of quote unquote grow out of it. And so sometimes that is the case where you have females that have been on the birth control pill from 15 to 35. And then they say, you know what? I finally have gotten married. I'm ready to have children. And then they come off and they can't. And so then they go see a naturopathic doctor. So obviously the worst case scenario in that situation is infertility. And that would be another sign that you'd have some hormonal issues. So definitely working with a naturopathic doctor 
or a, a kind of a functional gynecologist would be helpful. Um, if you have any history that your family doctor has ever told you or anybody, any healthcare providers told you that you might have uh, polycystic ovaries or that you've had any sort of endometriosis, that's a sign of hormonal imbalances. Those, both of those conditions are characterized by excess estrogen and, and in the case of PCOS, excess androgen. So these are like testosterone and DHEA. That's a huge sign. So if you've had any, any of those diagnoses before. Uh, obviously, if your cycle is irregular, is a huge one. Uh, if you're not getting that typical kind of 28-day cycle, uh, it might be shorter, but it's, it would be consistent. That's normal. But if it one, one cycle is, you know, 20 days and the next one's 30 days and the next one skips, like those are all signs that there's a regular things happening. So those are kind of like the, 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 the big signs in general. Now, specific for concussion patients and PCS patients, if they're wondering, you're listening to this and being like, could my hormones be causing some of the symptoms that I have? Or another way to think about it is that, could my hormones be the key to healing my brain? Because you have to look at it from both ways. It's not just that, oh, what's the cause? What's the cause? The concussion is the cause that initially started this, but that the brain injury could lead to a further hormonal imbalance. Like there's lots of research, Cam, as you know, about brain injuries causing long-term uh, issues with the pituitary gland. So for example, I've often uh, cited the study showing that after a concussion, so mild traumatic brain injuries, up to 37% of people had some sort of evidence, some hormone that was deficient up to one to five years after injury. And mm -hmm. so that's a huge range, first of all. Mm -hmm. Secondly, oftentimes we don't even think that that would be related back to our concussion. Mm -hmm. So if you have hormonal issues, think back, that concussion that you had when you slip and fell in the ice or you got Head, need in the head in soccer that took you a couple of months to recover, you might actually be still having issues from that, even though, you know, quote unquote, you know, the headache is gone and the concussion symptom has been resolved. You might have, you know, other uh, kind of like nagging issues that's responsible for that. So those would be kind of the, the key indications for addressing hormones. And the final thing I'll say is that anybody that's, you know, has PCS in my experience, it's at least worth testing to see if you have any of these deficiencies, if you have any of these issues, and at least you can get this done with the kind of a basic blood work screening for looking for your thyroid. So that's TSH, your cortisol, DHEA, estrogen, progesterone, LH, FSH, and prolactin. That's another big one that we haven't talked about. Prolactin's a, a, a pro-inflammatory uh, hormone, which is often obviously increased if you're if, in, when you're lactating, but if you're not, it shouldn't be elevated. And that has also been linked to pituitary dysfunction. And it actually changes. There's a research, a good research paper that came out by De, De Batista and his uh, Michael Hutchinson's group here at University of Toronto, looking at the acute effects of concussions. And they found in both sexes that prolactin went up, which is pro-inflammatory, and your adrenal hormones, DHA went down and progesterone went down. So that is in line with what we're talking about here. So just getting back to the, to the testing thing, is this, is you said it's a blood test. Uh, do they typically order an entire hormone panel at once? And like, what, if you're talking to your family doctor, what do you say? What do you ask them for? And does it matter when in the cycle you get this done or should you do it a few yeah. times? Those are great questions, Cam. First of all, these tests are not done regularly. Like, you know, unless uh, a person, like I'll say that if a person has a concussion, they're never done for that reason. You often have to go to them saying, you know, doc, I am like exhausted. And they might, they might run your iron, which is important mm -hmm. to do. And they might run your thyroid, your TSH. But in my experience, and I'm sure like it is in yours, trying to actually get your family doctor to run some of these hormone tests. Mm -hmm. I mentioned cortisol, DHEA, LH, FSH, prolactin, estrogen, progesterone, uh, and, and TSH, the thyroid hormones, you know, these are, this is kind of a, a pretty additional battery of tests. 
And so you need a pretty forward thinking family doctor. And so you, you're probably gonna have to advocate. You're probably gonna have to ask your family doctor to be like, hey, can we check out my hormones? My cycle has been way off. Uh, my libido has been way off. I, I, my energy is really low. You're gonna have to put some certain kind of descriptors along with that. You can't just go to them and say, can you test my hormones? Because as you, as you know, the standard of care is not cut up to the research. We're still like telling people to go home and sit in a dark room and rest, which we now know is totally not evidence-based. But I think in five to 10 years, our family doctor is going to be like, yeah, I'm going to start looking at their hormones because now we're starting to see pattern in the research. So, you know, you and I are a little bit are, are on the cutting edge for sure. And we're trying to sh get the message out there to our patients. And now even through this being like, you're going to have to advocate for yourself to get some blood work done. And if your family doctor is like, I don't really know what to do with this, which is fair, then maybe you need to ask to say, listen, I got to see a gynecologist because I have irregular periods and I'm still not getting, you know, anywhere with, you know, just the basic stuff. So you're going to have to advocate. And finally, the last thing I'll say is that at that point, um, you probably want to also work with a naturopathic doctor or a functional medicine doctor, because they're going to now guide you in telling you what specific tests that you might want to get. They could actually get some of that testing for you. And you may not have to haggle with them as much to figure out, you know, I want this or I don't want that. And they, they have access to other tests like the dried urine hormone test, which I do a lot with my patients, which is an additional test that's going to give us even more insight over and above blood work because blood is not the only way you can test your hormones. You can test your hormones through saliva. You can test your hormones through urine. You can test your certain hormones like cortisol through hair. These are all evidence-based ways of testing your hormones. It's not as simple as doing your blood because your blood changes. If I come at you with a needle, you're going to feel stress. Your cortisol is going to go up. <laughs> In, in, in reality, you may have a lower amount of cortisol than actually what you got at the test because cortisol fluctuates pretty rapidly in the bloodstream. So I think that you need to also advocate for yourself and, and look at other uh, experts and other resources that are going to really take your hormonal assessment to the next level. And they're going to guide you when to do these tests. Typically, you want to do it around the second half of your cycle, mid-cycle, around 20 to 22 days. That would be your best bet in terms of testing. But again, your the, your kind of your doc, your ND will guide you with that. So um, I just wanted to mention that the uh, the um, the test he was talking about with the urine is called the Dutch test. That's kind of the uh, the acronym for it. Um, it's dried urine. What is dried it? Dried urine test for comprehensive hormones. Right. So it's a Dutch test. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned the, you know, seeking other professionals in this. I know there's some endocrinologists that are getting into the concussion space now because of this reason. So it's becoming a more well-known thing, but my experience, just like people commenting here uh, on, 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 on our live feed saying that, you know, they've tried to talk to their doctor, their doctor won't order the hormones. And I've had several physicians that will tell their patients or ask them if I will get on the phone with them and explain to them why I want this done or, you know, all these things. And so I think if you're getting hassle and your doctor's not doing it, there are other options out there. If you can find a TBI literate naturopath, somebody who understands, you know, brain injury and concussion and how the hormones can be affected. Cause then they can look into that because this is something they, these hormones are so systemic. They affect so many aspects of our lives. And so the concussion symptoms that people experience are also so systemic and affects so many areas of our lives. So it just makes sense that with a hormone imbalance, it could be a, 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 a major explanatory factor for why, you know, someone is having the symptoms that they're having. So, and there's another, there's a question here that just came in. I just, I saw it here and I think it, it, it fits with what we're talking about. And, uh, so this person asks, are these hormonal levels compared to normative data? Like how much can these levels differ between individuals? So, you know, like what kind of range are we looking at? And mm. what, what I often find in the medical world is that the range of normal is so wide that nothing's abnormal until you're, you know, until you're dying. So what, you know, what kind of range is, you know, would you expect, and are people pretty tight or are there large ranges between people and how much individual variability is there? It's, it's a great question. And so the way the, we have to take a step back and just understand lab testing. So if, if you're going to put out a lab, any lab that is, is, is doing a good scientific process, they're going to get hundreds and sometimes thousands of data points to get ranges. And so before you even get any sort of test, you're 
your lab knows. And so we know very well established what the ranges are in, you know, uh, luteal, in follicular uh, phases, and in postmenopausal. Those are the three ranges you'll see on your, on your blood work. Um, so that's, that's, again, that serum blood hormones. So we'll know kind of what a normal range will also have a, an age range. So there's, and the same thing applies to saliva testing. The same thing applies to the dry urine hormone testing that we found. So we, you can feel very, as a clinician, I can feel confident in the data because I know that it's been compared against, you know, a standard population and I know what the ranges are. And so you are outside the range of um, the person A in your age range for a certain kind of cohort of normative data. So that's kind of, that answers the, um, the hormonal levels. And so we are, we are comparing PCS patients and concussion patients to normal levels. That's what we want to compare to. That's, that's the best thing we can do. Now, obviously the point is raised of like, what's your normal? Sure, there's a, there's a variance in that. That's why you know, I'm a big fan of getting baseline testing if you're a concussion. So this is just general baseline testing for neurocognitive um, testing. But I think that there's something to be said for if you're in a high risk sport, you should probably get some baseline hormone testing. And there's a lot of my patients do say, hey, listen, let's just get an idea of like where I'm at right now. I might have some lingering issues, but if I get a concussion now, I can quickly compare what, where my levels were before to where they are now. That would be the ideal world, but the reality is, is that 99% of people can't do that, maybe can't afford that, that's not practical. So that, that would be the ideal situation. Especially when you think about it from an athlete standpoint, I don't know how many athletes we have necessarily watching right now, but I mean, there's a lot of issues going on with athletes and their hormones just in general from overtraining and low body fat percentages and, and, you know, various supplements and compounds and things like that training regimens. And so without knowing where you normally are, or, you know, like it's a, everything's going to maybe appear more out of whack than it is. Who knows? Um, now getting on to kind of later on down the cycle, just, you know, into later stage, we probably have some people that are maybe a little bit older, but maybe even early for menopause. And there's concern that, you know, having a concussion might do something to trigger the onset of that. You know, can you maybe speak to that a little bit? You know, I, I think that I can't say that I've seen a lot of um, data on, you know, menopause being triggered by PC uh, by concussion uh, or, I, or even in my patient population, I haven't really seen that. I've definitely seen patients that now their cycle becomes irregular and they might lose their cycle. But in, in many times that most of the cases I can remember, we've found a way to restore that. So they're, they're, they're menstruating again. Um, even if they're in or around that menopausal, premenopausal range where they thought, well, you know what, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm past the childbearing years. Like I've had people mid thirties, and, and even like, you know, late thirties and forties that, you know, did have, did get pregnant again. And that's what they, they wanted. They just never thought that was possible because they were, their hormones were so, so regular. So I think that there, in theory, you could can, because again, it's another, it's another trauma, but we don't have, um, in, at least in mild traumatic brain injury or AKA concussion, I don't think we have data to say that it will trigger menopause. It definitely in a, in a, um, in a severe brain injury, where there's like massive loss of consciousness and you know, you, you've been hospitalized, maybe you've stayed overnight there. You have a lot more data on much more catastrophic neuroinflammatory conditions that have much bigger kind of uh, endocrine repercussions. Mm. So we were talking earlier about pituitary being kind of a site of injury following concussion, which is potentially leading to, you know, these imbalances. Now, how much do you think of is the result of injury itself? And how much of this do you think may be a lingering factor? I know this is very speculative, but how much of this may be a result of the stress that comes along with the injury? For example, you know, you know, you're not working anymore. You're, you're having all these symptoms, you're having daily chronic headaches, et cetera. Um, you know, how much of that do you think plays into that? Because a lot of these things, when they look at these hormone balances, usually it's, it's months after that they're picking this up. Right. So it kind of takes some time to evolve. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think this is related to the injury itself just based on, cause I mean, a lot of the speculation is that it's the, the situation, of the pituitary gland sitting in, you know, it's bony encasement in the cell tersica inside the brain. 
having like shearing stress put on it and things like that as the result of it. But could us being in this stressful fight or flight, you know, autonomic nervous system dysregulated state, could that be a trigger for some of this stuff? Yeah, Just your that, thought. I mean, that's a great question, Kim. Um, I will say absolutely there is a connection between, you know, being in that dysautonomic state uh, and the HPA axis. So the hypothalamus, which is the, the kind of part of the, the brain that controls the pituitary. So HP, pituitary, adrenal, which is these glands right above our kidneys that produce a lot of our stress hormones. They're hugely implica implicated in the post-traumatic uh, kind of pathway. And I'm going to say post-traumatic pathway because that could be post-MVA, that could be post-whiplash, that could be chronic pain. It's like any sort of trauma triggers that that HP axis. And even we have evidence in concussion that you have a decrease in cortisol production. So there's a kind of a short-term decrease. So there is a change in HP axis function. What we know about the HP axis is that it regulates our body's ability to deal with any sort of stressor. And it also regulates other hormonal systems because it produces a hormone called cortisol. One of cortisol's main jobs is to be an anti-inflammatory hormone. Plus, it also regulates many other functions in the body. Like, for example, it will decrease memory storage in the hippocampus in the brain. We've known this in Alzheimer's studies for many years, showing that they have smaller amounts, uh, smaller um, uh, volumes of the hippocampus for those people that have higher levels of stress and high levels of cortisol. We also know that women that are trying to get pregnant, when they have high levels of cortisol, while it's anti-inflammatory, it also is reproductive suppressant. So it basically cortisol's job is to keep us alive in the short term, day to day. It doesn't worry about what my bone health is going to be. High cortisol associated with osteopenia and osteoporosis. It doesn't worry about reproduction. It doesn't worry about retention of memories. It worries about getting energy to your muscles. It worries about um, getting blood flow and reducing inflammation. That's all. That's all it cares about. It cares about the basic functions. And so when you're, when a person is in constant state of fight and flight, their constant state of stress and um, their, their ability to cope is overwhelmed. Their sense of control is impaired and you're in that kind of dysautonomic state. I think that that has a really strong overriding role on all the other endocrine glands and all the other kind of endocrine or organs. So I, I think that it's, it's hard to tease that out in the research can because now you have multiple uh, variables where, you know, I think in general, that's why, and you and I have talked about this before, that's why PCS is just very poorly understood because there's so many confounding factors. There's multiple theories of why things are happening and it's never one thing. It's a combination of poor blood flow. It could be poor blood flow to the pituitary gland and also high levels of the HPA axis um, um, activation could be cortisol suppression. We don't know. And I think also within that PCS, things change. Initially, it could be that there is a hyper regulation of upregulation. Well, three years down the line, I've seen many patients with absolutely zero adrenal function. And they're kind mm -hmm. of like bordering on that Addison's. They're not quite Addison's, but they're, they're close. Mm -hmm. And that is not picked up by blood work often because you really have to be totally debilitated and, and, and totally, you know, in a, in a very deficient state. And oftentimes that's one of the frustrating things about concussion. Nothing shows up on imaging and really in blood work, you're not in ranges where your endocrinologist would say, Hey, you know what, this is an emergency. We need to like do something ASAP because your adrenals are failing. That mm -hmm. doesn't happen. It's very shades of gray, but Queen. And that's, that's the world that we live in with concussion patients is that they look normal, but they don't feel normal. Mm -hmm. So you're just, you just touched on kind of intervention. And so I think it's a good segue to maybe get into intervention. You know, what is, what, it, what is the treatment for various hormone dysregulation? Is it usually just replacement therapies or are there things you can do naturally um, to help, to help kind of regulate some of these issues? Yeah, I mean, I think the best way to answer that is, is that I think all of the above has a role to play, Cam. So for example, if a person's diet is poor, then it's harder for them to balance their hormones. How do, what do I mean by that? So 
as I mentioned, let's go back to the HP axis, which controls a lot of the other things, like it'll control your ovarian uh, production of estrogen and progesterone. Um, it'll shut down certain uh, functions in the brain and the, and the ovaries and the testes in terms of production of testosterone. Um, so if you're constantly having high levels of, 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 of cortisol, which regulates your blood sugar, and all you're eating is just junky food, which has your blood sugar going all over the place, that is another stressor. Your body doesn't know. It's like, I don't know the difference between having low blood sugar and about a, my boss yelling at me and having a chronic headache all the time. It interprets a lot of that as just, I'm under stress. So it doesn't differentiate between that. Our brain, our higher cognitive function differentiates with, between the two. But if you have a constant um, yo-yo between hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia, as an example, that is going to further put more stress on your hormonal system. And so one of the key things is, is we need to start creating balance in some of these hormonal systems to, uh, to allow other hormonal systems to stabilize. So we need to stabilize something and kind of break the cycle that keeps happening. So I always say a great place to start is sleep. If your body's not sleeping, if, if your brain's not resting, it's not eliminating uh, inflammatory cells that are part of the inflammatory cascade. It's not detoxifying the, the lymphatic system in the brain is not working. You have more buildup. You have more, um, you have less elimination, more stagnation in the brain. You're not going to be able to heal your inflammation. You're not going to be able to turn off your fight and flight mode because that is what is required to balance that excess sympathetic drive. So sleep is a great place to start. Even people think like, what's my sleep got to do with my hormones? Well, the, the brain interprets that as a way of healing and as a way of kind of giving the brain a break from constantly being under that kind of go, 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 fight and flight mode. And that's the time when your, your body can normally heal itself. And so that's just one example. There are, there are other specific foods that have hormonal balancing effects. Um, there's many of them, like some of my favorites are flaxseed, for example. There's lots of reasons why that lowers inflammation. It's fiber, which binds up some of the cholesterol and hormones in the gut and excretes it. Um, there are certain herbs that are hormone balancing that both on, on every single one of the things I talked about supports the thyroid, supports the adrenal system. You know, any of the ginseng family, which we've heard of uh, now, they're used all over the world. Um, like withania, which, or in other words, uh, for it's called ashwagandha is a, is one that's well studied for balancing the levels of cortisol. Um, there are other hormones that will do estrogen and, and progesterone balancing. And then there are specific nutrients that will also help increase or decrease. So again, it's hard for me even to say anything because I don't know what the levels are for some person. They may say I have, I have high levels of estrogen and I won't know until I actually test them. I need to bring that down. So there's a tremendous amount of personalization can that occurs. And there is um, lifestyle, diet, nutritional. And then finally, there are actual hormonal things like taking hormones. Mm. Typically, I recommend bioidentical hormones, which is the same as what your body has. That is usually just made from a plant, but it's exactly the same. That's why it's called bioidentical, where most of the hormones like birth control pill and, and hormone replacement therapy that we use in conventional medicine is synthetic hormones. And so there's evidence pointing to that synthetic hormones are, have higher, a higher kind of risk profile than bioidentical hormones because they're not exactly the same. They tend to be a little bit more potent. And with that comes some of the risks associated with them. So essentially just to kind of summarize that point, you're, it's almost like if you think about it like a pyramid where you're building your foundational elements along the way and then you know kind of growing up to there and then kind of at the top you may need some supplementation with some sort of bioidentical replacements what i find in my patients that actually do get this they go straight for the the top of the pyramid right without actually fixing the, the you know the bottom like you mentioned birth control pill that's a go to for many people many clinicians just to try and regulate right. cycle but like if you're not building the foundation of that pyramid and we talk about even even in in the in in, in the concussion fix program is that we don't start people off with rehab because it's just not going to work, right? We start people off with the foundational elements. It's like, you have to fix this. You have to fix sleep. You have to fix diet. You have to fix your blood sugar spikes. You have to fix inflammation. You have to fix your mindset. You have to fix all of these things before you can even move forward into the kind of next phase 
of of your you know of of, of 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 your treatment and recovery. So I think that's an important thing to get across is that all of this stuff is combined, but don't go right for the top of the pyramid, right? You have to build that foundational element. And that's where working with somebody like yourself, I think is an important piece that people might not actually, you know, kind of realize they go straight for the endocrinologist who's going to give them hormone replacement therapy. And they're going to think that that's going to be, oh, I've had my hormones check. Well, you know, what about the other elements of that piece, right? You're not just going to be able to take something outside. Like you have to, you have to heal from within, I think. And that's, uh, you have to also ask yourself, like, what's the end game? Like, so, okay. So I have hormonal, I have a hormonal imbalance. Um, all right. So if I just take the birth control pill, what do I do after that? Do I want to be on this for the rest of my life? Most doctors are now even getting wise to the fact that there are risk factors with doing this. Like, for example, you could get a blood clot and mm. it, it, it can have a very detrimental effect. And that's compounded with things like lifestyle, diet and family history. Um, and so I'm not against any of these things. I actually think that every single intervention that we have, almost every single one, has a role to play at the right time. So in, you're totally right. In an ideal world, you start with diet. And you start with lifestyle and you'd be surprised, just like we talk about in the concussion fix can you'd be surprised how many people just will get improvement just by doing that. Mm -hmm. Like I don't even need to give them bioidentical hormones because if you just regulate the foundations of your basic physiology, your body is intelligent beyond belief. It's going to start balancing a lot of this stuff mm -hmm. by itself without even giving you uh, a herb or a drug or, or, or a hormone. If we need to go to up the pyramid, absolutely. And sometimes to speed up the, the process, we do. And so we use nutrients, we use herbs, which are very safe, which are gentle, but effective and more effective than diet. For some people, they need something a little bit more than diet. So it'd be the same thing as saying like, hey, you know what, Cam, you're just going to treat with only exercise. You're not going to be able to put your hands on anybody because you don't want to move that muscle trigger point. Well, maybe in time, they might be able to loosen that out if they do enough roller yeah. balls or if they do enough, uh, you know, those types of things. But you could put your hands on somebody and get that effect in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Same thing applies to using like a, a herb or a nutrient to get that, that, that effect faster. It's not meant to be on forever. Nothing other than your diet and lifestyle. My belief is that you're sure supposed to be on it forever. Mm -hmm. An intervention, get you back in the balance and let your body's intelligence take over from there. It's funny that you say that just based on building that foundation. And, um, you know, I think that if, if you were to, I mean, like we use the example of, of, of the muscle work, I'll have people going to rehab and, or even re rehab professionals saying that they don't do manual therapy because they can do everything, you know, with exercise. It's like, yeah, sure. Eventually you'll get there. Like, you know, if you have somebody just do straight up exercise and not do any type of manual stuff, yeah, eventually you'll be able to work stuff out. But by, I could do the same thing in 30 seconds by just getting in there and kind of getting my hands dirty um, and, and, and going from there. And then the other, the, the other point you, you noted um, uh, was just interesting because today, like we, we mentioned earlier that we do these live sessions every week with the concussion fix. You weren't there this morning, but it was my, it was, it was my, myself and Melinda. And this patient said, you know, when she joined the program, she was like going through stuff and just, she was just going, well, yeah, I've done diet. I've done that. I've changed my diet. I've done exercise. I've done rehab. I've done all that stuff. And she said, the big thing for her is like in the first module, I say, slow it down and like master each phase, especially the foundational elements, which are mindset, diet, exercise. I say like basically master each one of those before you even move on to the next one. And she's like, so I made a promise to myself that I would commit to mastering something as part of my everyday life before I would even move on to see what the next section had in store. And she's like, I've really built up my foundation and that's been completely transformative for her. So she's somebody who's suffering from concussion symptoms for two and a half, three years and says she's done all the stuff that we're recommending her to do. But, but just by changing the way that she does it and really building out that foundation, which she said is really hard because when you're, you want to go forward, you want to get better right. now, but it's not how it works, right? It's building out that foundation, changing your diet, changing your life changing how you exercise, changing your mindset, reducing your stress, all of these things. And in the end, you may not even need the other pieces. You may not need the top right. of that, that pyramid. Right. So, right. um, I think there's a lot of stuff that people can even do at home. It just to try and start regulating some of this stuff. Um, you know, 
for sure just on their own um do you have anything to uh to add or or talk about before i just move over? i'm gonna go over here i don't know are you good for time for a bit do you want to answer yeah a couple we of, can we can answer a couple more questions i think we have yeah. some good ones happening in the in the ig yeah um no i mean I, I think that we touched on a lot of the things that you know are my takeaway points is that you have to look at everything in synergy in uh, in, not in isolation. You have to look at it in kind of the way that it normally occurs in the body. Um, unfortunately, our current medical system is very reductionist. They're like, show me the deficiency, I'm going to treat it. Mm. Well, how is your estrogen compared to your progesterone doing? Uh, how is your thyroid and what's the influence of your stress on that right now? There, there are tests that oftentimes are just kind of scratching the surface and bare minimum, like the TSH test, or just doing your estrogen progesterone, like you have to look at how are those metabolized and broken down because they often will tell the, the details in terms of what a clinician should actually focus on. So if you're really looking at assessing your hormones, you really need to take that to the next level. And, and don't forget about the basics, like we said, in terms of um, getting back into balance. And yes, I know there's probably people listening that are like, I've tried it, I've done that, and I still haven't got better. I mean, I know I have patients that have come to me and they've seen another naturopathic doctor before they've seen a functional medicine doctor before, but I think what, what really is important to understand is, is not just doing all the best brain things out there. Cause we're staying like, I'm taking the best brain supplement. I'm doing the breast brain rehab exercises. I'm doing all these things out there, but it's about the order and about the mastery of each one of those things. I think what you said there, Cam, is so important. And that's exactly the principle that I use in my practice is that we just don't jump right into, let's just stimulate neuroplasticity. That's the last thing that I do. Mm -hmm, right. Because how can you stimulate neuroplasticity when you still have inflammation happening? Mm -hmm. Your brain is on fire. How can I rebuild my house if you still have flames happening? Mm -hmm, right. So we need to get you out of that um, in neuroinflammatory mode. And even before that, there's a step before that where you need to get your, your nervous system in a situation where even it will accept any sort of intervention. If you are constantly not able to sleep and you're in constant kind of dysautonomia, forget about trying to do anything else after that. Yeah. Because your body will not let you, your nervous system will override anything else that you do. So your job is at that point is mindfulness, get out of fight and flight. There's lots of things we talk about in the concussion fix program that are exactly tailored to that type of phase. And I do that with all my patients. And then we progress to lowering in, uh, inflammation. Then we progress to balancing hormones. Then we progress to neuroplasticity and stimulating nerve regrowth. A lot of times people just jump to that. They go to these expensive clinics, they put them in a gyroscope and they're, they're supposed to, <laughs> no, but seriously, like they're, they're, they're supposed to like rehab from that. And, and their, their brain is like, they're microglia on fuego. Yeah, yeah, they're not. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it, I, that's probably one of the most common questions I get for people like wanting to enroll in the program. They're like, I'm pretty sure it's my neck. So can I just buy the neck module and just jump yeah. ahead to that? And I always say, no. I'm like, you might think it's your neck. You may have neck pain. You may have cervicogenic headaches. But if you just go right into treating the neck, but you haven't addressed the inflammatory aspects, the stress aspects, you're going to leave feeling great. But two days later, you're going to be all bunged up again. And that's, you're just going to be right back to square one. And it's never going to get better, right? So when you're looking for the quick fix, you're actually... <laughs> kind of um, paradoxically taking longer. You're taking the long road by going for sure. the quick fix. Um, and so I think that's just something. That, anyway, let's get, let's get over here to, uh, to some questions here. Someone sure. asked, some, asked what your name was. So this is Dr. Paul Herkel for those who are just joining us. <laughs> um, oh, somebody says, if, if anyone's debating joining the concussion fix program, I highly recommend it. Yeah. Thanks, Brianna. Uh, let's take a look. Da -da -da. There was a couple up here. Um, is low progesterone, high estrogen, a common long-term imbalance after PCS? Um, let's talk about some of the common presentations. First of all, the biggest, most common one that I see is typically lower progesterone and compare that and comparing that to estrogen, but it's not the most common one. So it is, it is a common presentation, but many times I actually see estrogen high progesterone can be high. DHA can be high. Those are all signs that your body's in a very kind of inflamed mode. You're, you're, it's like overproduction. So th th think about it this way from an allergy perspective. It's like the body's trying to do something like DHA has an anti-brain anti-inflammatory effect. So 
the, the body will upregulate the DHEA to try to quench brain inflammation. So on blood tests, you might say there's high amount of DHEA. Let's, let's lower that. Well, maybe that's not what we need to do because it's actually trying to do something in the body that's beneficial. We probably want to go in and start with the adrenal system. And so to answer your question, um, I think that the best way to go about, you know, and the most common presentation that I see is your adrenal function is either over functioning and, and producing a cortisol and DHA S at the wrong time. Like for example, at night and you can't sleep and it's very low during the day. So you're really tired. Once that is established, once that's balanced, then a person can get to bed better. They're less anxious. They're able to have more energy for the exercise, or they might have really low levels during the day and they're all fatigued all the time. They might have blood sugar issues that has to be properly addressed. Um, and so that's a very common presentation that I see is more on the adrenal side, but in general, um, I would say that yes, progesterone is a little bit lower than estrogen, but not always. I think you're seeing different questions than I am, but. Uh... Okay. Um, I just went up here. There's another one. Can birth control play a role? I stopped taking it at the same time as my injury, I but I made one. my PCS worse. Um, it's hard to know. I think this is from Brooke. Yeah. Um, it's hard to know, Brooke. I, you know, I think that we don't really have that data. What I will say is this, is that if you stop taking your birth control pill right after your concussion, you probably made the imbalance, whichever was occurring before, um, if you had any, which on, which on most of the cases, there was some, which is the reason that people start taking it, or if it's straight for just contraception, that's a different story. Remember, sometimes the birth control pill can just not allow the ovaries to properly produce estrogen and progesterone because they basically just suppress them. The body has this like feedback loop that if it's getting synthetic outside hormones, it's going to stop producing it itself. So there is like post birth control infertility. There's post birth control syndrome. I've seen this Dr. Kerry Jones, a colleague of mine posts about this all the time. So if you want to go like find more about that, I would check out, find her Instagram. Um, that's Dr. Carrie Jones. And she talks about birth control pill and all the kind of like kind of subtle effects that we often just don't even attribute to birth control. Not to mention that it can deplete a lot of nutrients like B6, for example. But so it's hard to tell Brooke whether that, that um, it might've done nothing, um, but definitely it would, it would lead me to say, you should probably get your hormones fully assessed and uh, taken care of. There's another one here about spec scan. Um, I can kind of address this spec scan sure. looks at, looks at blood flow. Um, and so it's not really, it's not really detecting hormones or anything like that, but we have found blood flow abnormalities in concussion looking at spec scans. The problem with spec scans, cause they've been, they've been marketed somehow to the PCS world because of blood flow issues. Cause we know that it's present, but the problem with it is we're going to see the same blood flow abnormalities in concussion as you're going to see in depression, as you're going to see in anxiety, as you're going to see in people with chronic pain, back pain, neck pain, you know, shoulder pain, you name it. Somebody in pain is going to also have altered blood flow and going to have alterations on spec scans. And so I think just from a PCS standpoint, people trying to look for some sort of diagnostic imaging or something to show that there's something wrong. You know, I want to, I want proof that there, my brain is, is, is there's something wrong there. If you get a spec scan, you will show some abnormalities, but that doesn't necessarily mean those abnormalities are concussion specific. They may be due to the fact that you're in pain. They may be due to the fact that you're under stress. They may be due to the fact that you have anxiety. They may be due to the fact you have depression. And we don't know enough yet about what any specific patterns of these conditions to be able to pick up this one's depression, this one's anxiety, this one's et cetera. So getting a spec scan, it's going to show abnormalities and always they will say this is because of concussion, but we don't actually know that. So that's actually kind of a, kind of a crock. So um, I would say if you're thinking about getting a spec scan, you have to ask yourself, why, what is it actually going to show me? Because it's actually not going to show you anything. Um, well, even know, more, I actually ask the next question. I always say, what treatment is it going to allow me to do? So like every test should be judged based on, is it going to help me direct my treatment better? Right. So, and you yeah, know what? So and, you have and, less blood flow. What are you going to do? Are you going to take something to increase your blood flow? Are you going to do H hyperbaric? I don't know. You're going to do exercise is what you're going to do. Right?
And that's, and that's kind of the evidence-based pathway. And I think there's a lot of stuff, even you talk about that can improve blood flow. So that's what you're going to do. I can do that. You might as well do, you might as well just go right to that, right. Rather than trying to, you know, first find out if there is blood flow impairment, just assume that there is, because all of the stuff is, is, is good for you to do anyway, exercise and, you know, improve cerebral blood flow. So it's like, we, I hear about it all the time in my chronic pain clinic, where they always say, just be very careful with imaging because it's, it may tell you something that you don't even need to know. It may give you a total false sense of security. Oh, you know what? My, my blood flow is normal, but I have all these symptoms. Okay. So you're, you're at the same spot that you were before you should do all the things you should do all the foundations that we've talked about anyways. Um, there's a bunch of questions here about, uh, my PCS also gets worse with PMS for sure. Like that's a huge thing because again, PMS is that point where your hormone levels go down both your estrogen and progesterone that again, exposes underlying hormonal issues and underlying hormonal imbalances. So oftentimes, the first thing I'll notice in patients is that their PMS is a lot worse after their concussion in their PC and even years out, they've had, you know, all of a sudden bad PCS. Again, a big sign that your hormones is something that you should be testing and getting looked at. Um, and that probably has a big role to play again, if not at the root cause for your, for your symptoms, possibly in creating, if I can borrow a term from Dr. Mark Gordon, who is like a guru in interventional endocrinology, to create a neuro permissive environment for your brain to heal. Your hormones can create a neuro permissive environment that allow your, that allows your brain to heal. Um, so just, just a quick question, yeah. follow up on that. Now, it, like, so let's say it's PMS, right? So you've had this, this drop in progesterone levels and progesterone being an anti-inflammatory, how much of do you th- just in your mindset, how much do you think uh, the symptoms are maybe just doing to like uncontrolled inflammation at that time versus the actual hormones themselves? Yeah, the, the mechanisms that, you know, intriguing, we for sure know there's inflammation happening. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I think that I think again, like the HP axis, all these things are happening at the same time camp. So it's hard to tease out is it, what's it, what's, what's what, because we know that a lot of these hormones have an anti-inflammatory effect. So could there, is it that their deficiency is causing it in their own right in terms of their own receptors, or is it because they're actually influencing uh, another, you know, immuno inflammatory cascade? It's probably both. Mm. Um, they're also having a huge role to play with blood flow. We know that serotonin has a role to play with migraines now, and that has to do again with regulating receptors that regulate blood flow. So, I think that you have, you can't look at these things in isolation, which is again, why I think, you know, with my patients and what I, with a concussion fix is that we insist on doing all the foundational things first, and that will basically level the playing field to say, all right, we've just created the optimal metabolic environment for you to get better. Now we can truly see what are the symptoms that are remaining. Is it, is a bunch of my symptoms and my headaches to do with the types of foods that I'm eating? Um, is the button so am I just out of shape? And my cardiovascular system has poor blood flow. Those are all things that um, also play a role. So um, mm. I think that has all these conditions and also all these situations and factors play a role. I think it's both can. Mm. I just, I just thought of that. I didn't, uh, I've never really thought of that before. I just thought just kind of crossed my mind, but um um, someone asked if this is going to be recorded. Yes, it will. It'll be up on my YouTube channel. If you go to complete concussions, YouTube channel, uh, all of our episodes are up there. So you can see all sorts of different things. This one will be up. Usually it takes a week for us to kind of, uh, to get it up and ready, but it will be up. So if you missed anything, don't worry. Uh, I'll probably post this video to my Instagram too. So you can watch it right from the start, uh, today. If, if, uh, if you want to, um, exercise and professional help and support made me invest in the concussion fix. Sweet. Um, do, 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 do. Someone's asking what the program is. Yeah. The program is called the concussion fix. That's the program that we do. There's just a little bit more in depth, uh, than what we do. And we're on there. So we're answering questions. We do live sessions like this every week for people inside that we have various topics that we cover. So just helps to keep people accountable and on the right track and have them be able to go back and review information. And, um, it works really, really well, actually. 
Um, I mean, this is a general question, but let's maybe finish up with this one. What foods uh, should a person avoid with PCS or brain injury? Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's like a whole a, topic. Itself. I know, I know. But if you maybe want to just, just touch on, on, you know, a couple just, and, and just more categories of, of foods, um, you know, surrounding inflammation and gut and permeability. Yeah. And I think that's probably why the topic is much bigger is because you could talk about it from uh, inflammatory perspective themselves. You can talk about it, the types of fats that are in it, which are either pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory. You can also talk about it from a food sensitivity perspective that also has kind of an immunogenic and allergic type of inflammation. Um, and so you can also talk about it from a gut perspective. So all those things are obviously a lot more detailed. So what, I mean, what I can really basically say right now, especially as it relates to hormones, is that you want to eat foods that are a real foods. And that sounds like super basic, but you need to make sure that you're eating real foods and processed foods have all the things in it that you should not be consuming that are going to be pro-inflammatory. Um, the difference between uh, frozen pizza and you know something that you will actually maybe and a real pizza from pizza. Italy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, but it's better. But okay. But even if if we do that, so we say that tongue in cheek. But if you make if you home make your pizza, you know exactly what's going into it. You don't need to put four or five other ingredients in it that are going to be more preservatives than anything else. And so all that has a pro-inflammatory effect. I will say the one thing that I've noticed over and over again with my patients is that, you know, food sensitivities, especially gluten is a huge issue. It's a, it's neuro inflammatory. It's, it makes the gut more permeable, makes the blood brain barrier potentially more permeable. So that's a big one. Uh, and then as many different uh, colorful fruits and vegetables as you can. So I, any, I don't discriminate against any type of food that normally comes out of the ground or eats plants. I'm not a vegan proponent. I'm not a keto proponent. I'm a proponent of eating the most whole foods and making sure that we're hydrated. So I have a much more balanced approach. And that's probably, as you probably told, if you've been listening for the last hour and a bit, that's probably what you've been able to tell is that I'm not extreme to say, hey, you know what, you need to be shooting yourself up with growth hormone nonstop to try to, you know, heal your brain. There are doctors that are doing that. Um, and that is not my, that is not my approach. I feel like that is a short term approach. And it is not, it's extreme. And it, it may not, it's definitely not healthy for you in the long run. So if you just do the foundations, eating low, no or low processed, especially refined sugars, increasing the colorful fruits and vegetables, and cutting out things like, uh, especially inflammatory foods like gluten, um, that's a great place to start. But the Concussion Fix program does a great job at going into that. We go over meal plans, recipes. We talk about the influence on the gut. Uh, and there's other podcasts and other lives. So check out my Instagram. I've talked a lot about diet. I've talked a lot about this. Cam and I, you and I, I think you and I have talked about diet before on this podcast. I yeah, believe. we have. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. If you, if, if, even if you go to our YouTube channel, there's probably videos of us talking like in depth about that. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just going to answer one more question here and then, uh, we'll kind of wrap things up. So this person is a, uh, seems like a vestibular therapist and they deal with patients after accidents, usually seeing them for BPPV, anything I need to keep in mind as so not to make things worse. Now, I think the thing that, uh, you should just be kind of cognizant of, I don't think from a BPPV standpoint, there's going to be anything that you're going to do. That's going to make anything, you know, worse. I mean, that's a pretty straightforward thing. If it's truly BPPV, um, sometimes if you have patients though, that are, you know, have reporting ongoing dizziness and, you know, everything checks out from your Dick's hall pike, your supine roll testing, everything, you're not actually finding, you know, true nystagmus and it's starting maybe not to look like a BBV. Then there's other things that, that should be considered. Um, there was people up here already mentioning that when they're in their PMS state, they feel more dizzy, right? So it could be inflammation. It could be hormones. It could be uh, neck. It could be cervical genetic it could be psychogenic it could be there's a lot of different things so i think just um the big thing for those that are kind of they have more of a focused lens like on vestibular um a lot of times we tend to look at that lens and assume that everything falls into that lens that is our category right like i tend to have a bias towards neck i tend to look more for neck dysfunction than than most people would but i also try to think about it from a, from a, uh, a, 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 a broader kind of lens. So I would say if you're, if your focus is on vestibular, 
uh, and it's starting to be like, you know what, this doesn't typically present as like true classic BBV or I've already fixed the BBV, but they're still having issues. I would maybe just try to look more on a comprehensive, you know, concussion uh, perspective um, and think about the other things it could be, it could be blood flow, could be, you know, it could be a variety of different things. And so I think that's where having the full comprehensive concussion knowledge uh, is, it would be a helpful thing. And if not you, you can always, you know, try to find somebody in your area to, uh, to work with, but that's how I'll wrap it up. Anyway, Dr. Paul Herkel, thank you very much for joining me today. You're welcome. People can find you uh, at Paul, uh, Dr. Paul Herkel. That's H R K A L, yep. um, and on Instagram, that's usually where you hang out. Um, and um, yeah, anywhere else? Anywhere yeah, else? Just my website, which you can find off my Instagram. So it's very simple: Paul Herkel ND at dot com. Paul Herkel ND dot com. You can find out more information about there. I've got some good resources about specific videos, and then just you know check out the program um, concussiondoc.io. Yeah. And we talk a lot more about that. Yeah. There was people asking about, about the concussion fix program. If you go to concussiondoc.io, concussiondoc.io, you'll see there's information there. There's all the modules and kind of the breakdown of what it is. There's, you know, some videos and stuff like that, that you guys can check out. Uh, we also have a free 14 day money back guarantee. So if you want to just try it out for 14 days, give it a go, see how you like it. Uh, okay. So that's it for us. And uh, thanks Paul again for joining and uh, we'll have you back thanks, at everyone. some point. I, I know it. Awesome. See you. Thanks, Cam. Cheers, guys.